Genevieve Leveille, who's a founder of AgriLedger, a very exciting blockchain startup here. So she, Genevieve's going to be telling us a lot about how blockchain is being used specifically in the food supply chain with some really cool real life examples um, of how their project is being used. Thank you to Tracer. So this, this Tech for Sustainability series is sponsored by them. They're a connected value chain platform. They foster a culture of innovation and encourage sustainable business practices and ensure customer trust and consumer trust in the diamond industry. So they're demonstrating provenance, traceability and authenticity of natural diamonds and help the local economies where they're being mined. And they work with De Beers and some of the largest diamond producers around the world. So anyone can find out more, please go to community.tracer.com. That's T-R-A-C-R. -R, so community.tracr.com. Thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to get to tell you guys a bit about the AgriLedger solution and how we are doing in Haiti. So we're really going to be talking about the next level in the food supply chain. Some of you might have heard of Haiti more in the context of what has happened in terms of hurricane and also, unfortunately, the earthquake about 10 years ago. What many of you may not know about Haiti is that not only is it beautiful, but it has a lot of history. And part of the history of Haiti is that it was the first black nation to gain its independence by force. And this is a citadel, which is a fortress, which stands on top of Haiti. Um, Haiti, up till its independence, actually accounted for about 40% of the wealth of France. And that was through the sugarcane business. And uh, this was 1796, 1804 is when they got their independence and sugar was the key. And actually, I wish I could find this article again, but it talks about how there was actually very much like um, the Bitcoin, an exchange, a virtual exchange around sugar credits, which was run around the Caribbeans. And it was against the future delivery of sugar. So that was really a big part of it. Today, Haiti is a place which has a lot of concerns which how do with geopolitical issues so and some of that is something we're very familiar with which is oil about 10 years ago the uh, venezuelan when they were flush with money gave credits to many of the countries in the in the environment in the caribbeans and that was sort of like their campaign against the u.s unfortunately as with many of those countries uh, where there isn't very good governance, the money seemed to have disappeared. So even though now we are in lockdown, Haiti has been in lockdown actually since November, 2018, on and off, on and off. And from September until January, the streets were impassable. So everybody was down and they were calling it pay lock. Now I'd like, to, I didn't ask, but I'd like to ask uh, somebody in Haiti, why are they calling it now? Because the world is locked down. The economic reality of Haiti is, it is the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere, in the Caribbean and uh, in the American hemisphere. There does not seem to be a way out, unfortunately. And when we look at just food import and export, Haiti produces almost a billion worth of food. Of that, only 25 million is exported and does import about 1.2 billion. And these are um, information from the FAO uh, chart. And it's disconcerting because actually with all the challenges we've been having, if you can think about it, bringing in food is even more difficult and the, pop the devaluation of the currency is happening on a regular basis. So now I'd like to talk to you about the project a little bit and in terms of really of who we're aiming the solution at. It is for smallholder farmers, but really smallholder producers. And for them, there's three vital aspects to the 
food supply chain, or I would say even to the value chain, which is the production, the delivery, and the sale. And in Haiti, what we have done is we have actually implemented the application first for the mango value chain. So this is how the mango is actually being harvested and transported at this time. This boy may be maybe 12, 13 years old. That was on my trip to the countryside last year. And as you can imagine, those fruits, uh, imagine, look at the size of the fruits, bigger than his foot actually. But those fruits are prized in not only in Haiti, but also in the US. And some of the statistics that we've been looking at are just unbelievable. The other thing is that they can only be imported in the US between the month of March till the end of July, maybe beginning of August. Um, so really, as you can imagine, what we are targeting is in a very communication challenge country, not only in communication in terms of language, but it's more in terms of the infrastructure for uh, data and cell phone. I will actually say the, the cell phone works very well, but data is a challenge. And it doesn't matter if you have bought the data plan, many a time you cannot even have access. Though lately, I'm not sure it's only Haiti because I know several people have had some difficulties with the telecommunication in during the pandemic. But imagine this is acerbated. Now, the other thing is, how do you take a process which is very informal, not even paper-based, there are some paper-based, but move it to where you start using technology such as the blockchain? And the reason for this project really was um, a DIE. And I don't know if any of you know what a DIE is, but it is actually a grant made by the World Bank to countries, usually emerging technology, emerging economies, to support them. And this DIE had something very special, which is to say, this is about addressing the bottom 40% of poverty. And globally, if we look at the bottom 40%, we will actually see that most of them are involved in agriculture in terms of if they are making any income. So either they have no income or they are doing meager and substantial, uh, not substantive, sub surviving really agriculture. And how do you give these people an ability to actually prosper? distributed technology came in very well because it allows not only for one to be able to retain ownership and also demonstrate participation but it also from a customer standpoint is able to provide the customer a view with not only where does the food come from but also that the individual who has been participating, so you start having transparency as who's participating, have all the certification, not certification itself in paper, but all the steps that are required for certification, can they be evidence? Some of those as customer, we will not want to know, but others we will want to know. So how do you get to the value chain? This is actually what the factory floor looks like. As you can imagine, it's chaotic when it's going on. It's the, there's a whole process as the mangoes are received to actually uh, be able to wash, clean, triage, and then send them for a lovely bat of about 45 degrees for an hour. Uh, the other day, there was a problem with the electricity and a whole batch of them actually got fried. So this is not a happy time for everybody. Now, in terms of what we did uh, with AgriLedger, we spent from September 23rd, 2019, till about January, working with the application in the lab with the uh, team from the Haitian government and also the World Bank, provide, uh, refining the system because obviously we couldn't be in the ground. When they started the first run, they actually had the people who were going to the to those field were kidnapped 
So it really showed that it was not safe to actually have people on the ground uh, working. So we took the time, instead of having a, a pilot or a beta version, which was being used on the field, we did the beta in the lab, which in hindsight was great because had we not done this, we would not have felt able or confident enough to roll out this application without any of us from my team being on the ground. So on the 12th, the first go ahead was actually to get pineapples. And this is one of my favorite pictures because you've got these five women going up the mountain to go get the pineapple. And the gentleman in front is actually one of the agronomists which is working with the team and not only helping them choose the best quality, but also looking at education and how we can educate the producers. On May 1st, the first shipment left of mango for the US. And I think it's a beautiful day because that's the day of labor. We were supposed to go live around end of uh, mid-April, but as we all know, the world that we know changed. And with coronavirus, there was a, there was a bit of worry that the FDA was actually going to be able to send the inspectors and eventually fresh fruits were deemed to be necessity in the U.S., which meant that the uh, show could go on. Now, these are some of the numbers in Haiti as of the last month. Uh, so we have serviced over 43 farmers. The government has been registering the farmers, and right now there's about a database of about 700 with the look of increasing this by 20% each month to where they believe there is about 200,000 farmers who will have the opportunity to use the system. There's been over 6,000 kilos of uh, mango from this group, which has gone through. Unfortunately, this with the start of uh, service, there have been hiccups like not picking the right thing. So the rejection rate used to be about 80%. We are aiming to get it down to about 40%. We've made a dent because it's at 61, but still not acceptable. So as you can imagine, that means twice, a bit more than twice had actually been harvested. Ideally, we should also be looking to support innovation from the root to actually create circular economy. So I think with mango, you could create mango jams and different things, but I think that we shouldn't be telling them what to do, but we should be empowering them to have enough income. In terms of income, we have actually been able to demonstrate during this time that they have gotten 5x what they would have gotten in normal market condition. So which means that they would have sold it prior to leaving 80 and by them being able to retain all the way to market, they went up to 5x. And uh, remember I said to you one of the issues with communication. So the way we're dealing with this is actually SMS. So we've sent in the last month over 224 SMS to the farmers, letting them know when the goods have reached Port-au-Prince, when they're on the boat, when they have been sold, and finally they will be receiving. And as of this week, they should have, some of them will have received uh, messages that actually there is a payment coming their way. The mechanics of this, obviously we would love to be able to use system. And as you can see, this is representative of the system in use right now. This is an old uh, soda bottle trays and those are used to be able to milk out the, the mango so that they don't get brownished by the time they actually are being sold. The other thing is, this is how temperature is being, the ambient temperature is actually being measured. It was pretty hot on that day. And we now need to look at not only how do we create the handovers from the farmers to the collector. So to give you a quick one, the farmer calls in. At this time, he's calling in someone. Eventually, he will be able to send a message to say how much he's expecting to deliver. Once it's received, uh, there's a date given as to when he's going to be able to collect and when the amount that has been collected from him. So he, let's say he brings a thousand and two hundred of them 
are rejected. Those are also captured into the system. When it gets to the factory, it is processed. And the process, there will be some rejection and there will be some testing. And that then allows you to see there's an expected number which is received at the end in the boxes. Each mango will have on it a QR code and each box also will also uh, be able to relate what's in that box. And finally, the palette with the QR code. Ideally, so that's one level, ideally you would also be looking at IOTs to be able to measure temperature because what happens is that the first temperature that has been taken is when the farmer brings it in, we try to measure, did he actually pick it this morning or did he pick it two days ago? Well, way of finding out is actually the internal uh, temperature of the mango. If the mango is too hot, then it'll get rejected. That information will get collected and that means the farmer loses. From transportation or from the field to the warehouse, there is actually a timing that has to take within 12 hours. So we use smart contracts to actually measure that timing from the time the farmer signs an agreement, which is giving the right to everyone down the value chain to support him, the bank, the transportation, the transformation, or even taxes that have to be paid on his behalf is all agreed to with that smart contract. But everyone, including ourselves, become service providers to him. So we inform him that we will basically make sure that his data is okay, the privacy exists, and only make that information available to those who need it, or if there is something with the government. Once it has been reached the US, the uh, importer will take care of selling. And that sell, when the money comes in, is distributed to everyone at the same time. So there is transparency. And in ways, we're starting to imply uh, cost of goods sold. Now, this is giving you a view. Actually, this is the mangoes which were received last week. The first box is in the factory on their way. And then the second one we received last week. Uh, and as you can see, it wasn't so good because the temperature, the internal temperature was twice what it should be. We need to understand what went wrong there. And also this will be put into the, into the blockchain. Obviously, we're going to have to work through some of the concerns with so much transparency because I'm already getting, well, it's good, but no, don't know if we want to have that. So this is really going to be more the next phase, what I say the next phase of the blockchain, which is the data management. These are examples of some of the current, what they call loggers. And this is a picture of the, in the US uh, receiving. Now, in terms of the community, what I explained is, if we think about it, uh, in a month, we have increased income in a community by 5X, where in these days and age is almost, you could say it was zero. From zero to a possibility and an actual 5X, how do you then are, what are the changes that you're making to that community? So what is so important is the education that goes with it and all those aspects that we have to also deal with. And this is why I don't think it's just about the technology. It's going to be how do you educate and how do you invigorate those individuals toward innovation and how do you bring other aspects, which of course are going to be part of it, such as financial inclusion. Um, bringing this at scale, we don't uh, foresee that this is going to be a problem. Even though we use the term blockchain, I think this is very much in the same vein as uh, saying Kleenex, meaning uh, tissue paper. We have chosen to actually use the Archery Corda DLT uh, solution. And the reason for that is that I felt that being able to maintain the privacy and also maintain the by design information. So I don't know how many of you know how the nodes will work, but basically each node functions without knowing what the other node knows. So in terms of nodes, we have nodes for the farmers, 
nodes for the bank, nodes for the transportation, and nodes for the broker. This way, it allows for healthy commerce to happen because one of the things that you, you want to be able to continue is to have price on gamification. So really, this allows for a bit more for the gamification. Is it to so say it, the, the mango um, import season that you mentioned from March to July, is that due to the agricultural season there or is it due to some sort of bureaucracy or it's regulatory it's actually regulatory to the u.s and protectionism the mango actually so one of the things that uh i learned is the variety of mangoes globally that we find are only five mostly in the u.s we tend to see only five of them because the can't i think told me the mon- the Haitian mango. The reason is that because of the bath that has to be taken by the mangoes for 45 degrees for an hour, you need a skin which is thick enough so that the fruit doesn't get ruined. And also there are schedules that the U.S. government says as to when it can be imported. We are hoping that through this, there will be the ability to actually provide access to further markets than just the U.S. to the Haitian mango because the uh, mango needs to be transported within a certain time mm-hmm. at a certain temperature, which means it'll last longer. How is the timeline affected for the smallholder and the, the, such as the time taken from the harvest to them receiving the income? So in terms right now, this is still a challenge because the st- supermarkets or the buyers tend to have terms which are themselves about 30 to 45 days and then normal practice will be that the broker will then himself add another 30 days what we're looking to do the next phase is to really be able to look at instruments such as you know normal instruments which are already there which are invoice financing Mm -hmm. so by invoice financing but against the pnl of the buyer rather than the the exporter or the farmers, then we can get to probably a reduction of 120 basis points per year. Because mm-hmm. most of those are going at about a 30 to 40% normally. And now if that would mean time 12, so you can imagine, and we've been able to get to where it will be in the range of 2% to 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5 it is if it's based on blockchain technology. No. What stops the QR code labels from coming off? The QR codes are actually already the ones that are used. They're they're specifically made for fruits. So if you go in the supermarket, you usually will have certain stickers on your on your fruit. So what we have done is we've actually worked with a company in Mexico which produces them. And so they meet the regulatory aspect in terms of the glue not being um, harmful and also they don't tend to to drop off the other thing is that given that these are going to be mostly eaten pretty quickly Mm -hmm. there's no reason they 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 haven't been seen to be coming off for any reason Mm -hmm. how is the use of blockchain being determined to the success of the project why you're using blockchain specifically because so what happens is that the blockchain technology allows the distributed ledger technology allows for evidencing uh, a chain of custody. So the chain of custody, and also it belong to who has been part of this chain, is something that you can do, and mm-hmm. that data is not controlled by one organization or one, one individual. Uh, the benefits to the producers are going to be twofold. So the first one is ownership all the way through to the uh, exporting country, mm-hmm. uh, importing country. But secondarily, once we bring in this financial aspect to it, you will be able to get money to them much quicker, which means time value of money will be there. Mm-hmm. And for those who are participating uh, as service providers, they will also get expediency current term if you think about it it's about from march april for the start of season finishing at the end of july Mm -hmm. if we think about when things it takes about a week to get it out by the time the exporter gets paid 
it's almost three months out. So he does not see any money until such time as is almost done. With this, they will see money much quicker because they get paid for the work that they're doing much quicker. And also there isn't the, the advance payment. And that's why we were also seeing about an 80% waste because the farmers will give against quantity, not quality. So part of the, the learning that we're having with them is really teaching them how to take care of quality because quality, so which means don't pick the mango if it's green. If you pick it, it's going to get rejected. And as such, you're going to lose income. Uh, about the role of the smallholders, are they expected to input any kind of data? And if so, how, through what channel or what, what sort of equipment do they need? And what is the literacy level um, required for them? And what kind of infrastructure level is required for this to work, such as mobile data and mobile networks, for example? So you don't need mobile data, you need mobile network. And I would suggest that most one of the requirements for them to participate is actually having a cell phone at this time in the start what they have been asked to do is to call someone who puts it into the system for them but the idea is that we're going to be looking to implement usdt which is the sms technology which is in use for the m-pesa mm -hmm. in case people don't know what m-pesa is m-pesa is the p2p payments uh, procedure which is used in kenya it's about 10 years old now. I mean, I've been in the bushes in Kenya and the bushman can take a payment using his mobile phone. Information is really what's necessary. So being able to say, and in terms of literacy, I think that we sometimes put too much of an emphasis in being able to read a sentence. People can understand and see you know, they may not know how to read, but they know what a one looks like and they know what a two looks like. Try giving to somebody the wrong number when you owe them money. They will know, but they don't need to know how to read. Same thing also the technology nowadays allows for voice. So I think that saying literacy is not, I don't see it as a barrier. And then finally, I think that where we really want to see is a change whereby kids or youngsters can actually go back and become farmers be, uh, and have an opportunity to be pros prospering from that so they can go to school and go back usually now what's happening in most of the world is those uh, children are being encouraged not to stay on the farm because there is no hope and that's not just in Haiti it's globally about the QR stickers how they're created and what data do you have for them and who are they vetted by? Are they vetted by agrovets or? So the QR stickers are actually pre-printed and we are able to write to them. So basically there's a big roll of them which were sent in and they are kept in the factory. And then they are, when they have a, a batch, they will save there's a hundred, let's say 150 in that batch or, uh, or that lot, they will go from one to 150 and those stickers get assigned. And the information is then related back to the blockchain. With the first uh, outing, we haven't gone into much in terms of very high security, but we are talking to partners which are looking at new types of stickers. Because one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want to add to the cost the item itself so you need to keep something which is low enough so for this we went with something which is working up to 0 0.001 cent of the of the cost the actual fruit itself so it's very insignificant but eventually we'd like to get to much more efficient but again what you would want to do is have something which is pre-printed because the last thing you want is the machine has gone down or any kind of such a problem and you can read them with the reader and assign them through the application. Do any of these mangoes get to London? Not yet. We want to get them to London only when I smuggle them in. Oops. 
<laughs> I didn't try the mango, just the avocados. <laughs> you ensure data privacy for the farmers. Yes. So at this time, the next phase that we're doing is really looking at the data uh, modeling. I have to admit I have become enamored with the whole concept of uh, federated learning, which is basically algorithms which are distributed. And one of the challenges is that even though we have distributed uh, systems with blockchain, still the way we are providing data is very much all the data set is available and known by one. So I am looking to work with New Jersey Institute of Technology on how could we actually advance this. So this would give several uh, aspects. So if you start thinking in terms of production, so you know, in the mango or not so important, but if we start talking corn and wheat, which are both used for the purpose of alimentation and also for creating chemicals, then you want to understand what is available throughout your production in country, what is available in the host country and all that information without divulging all the data. So someone who needs to know the data in terms of production does not need to know who actually has done the production and may not even need to know, depending on their role, where the production was done. So these are different aspects that we're looking to implement as we go forward. If you onboard the data for each mango separately on, on blockchain or, or is it done on a batch basis and how do you handle large volumes of data? So in terms of the data, we are actually inputting everything onto the blockchain. So every piece of data goes in. But the way you end up doing is you say this farmer has bought in, let's say a farmer bought in 500. 300 were accepted. What goes onto the floor, let's say to get a sticker, is 250. So you mm -hmm. keep track that 250 is what this farmer has. We know the number from, let's say, 1 to 250 belongs to that farmer. And we don't generate that. So it's not a lot of data at that point. But when someone gets that mango and uh, scans the QR code using their phone or their mobile device, then they will get uh, a response back from the server, letting them know certain information such as where was the mango harvested? When was it harvested? Who harvested it? Should the supermarket or the buyer allow, we will let also be known what are the different costs that have been allocated to each part of the value chain. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to do thereafter is also being able to give the carbon footprint uh, for that, that's been actually one of my challenges, trying to get access to the maps, to the, to the geo maps of the country, because if we, we would need to have the satellite mapping to be able to tell exactly the geolocation of where the farmer came from, and then being able to map it throughout this journey. If there's any hardware that smallholders need to invest in or have access to in order to be part of your offering, or are they all set if they've got a mobile phone? Just a mobile phone. The collector and the uh, transportation and the... So in terms of the, the agronomists, like the team which is working with the farmers, they need either a smart, uh, smart tablet, smartphone to be able to enter the information once they receive it. But eventually, as we said, we want that to be removed so they will be working more on the education rather than capturing the information from from the farmer itself the um, idea is that the collector will have a smart uh, tablet which allows him to be able to allow the farmer to digitally sign the agreement also and present the information to the farmer because there will be one big contract to sign that's signed by the farmer but every time he comes in, there's an addendum as how many he has bought in. So the repeat customer will have that. Aside from that, there is going to be eventually a need to do some sort of investment in infrastructure in terms of IoT to have the transformation, the transformation uh, be complete. 
at this time, one of the challenges that we've seen is that we're having people enter information such as temperature. So obviously there will be opportunity for tempering at that point. Whether you think mobile and SMS technology uh, does work effectively based on that, whilst some researchers have shown that the technology is, is good in developed countries, that a lot of people um, in developing countries maybe don't know how to use it and that sometimes the feedback process is slow and do they need any cloud technology or, or anything to manage the supply chain? The um, effectiveness of mobile phone and SMS technology in the developing world. Some uh, research has shown that whilst the technology for mobile phones is very good to be able to send data, for example, in the developed countries, sometimes very basic phones um, maybe don't work so well or that people don't necessarily know how to use them and that there's slow feedback. Has that been a problem? No, that has not been a problem because what happens is that you call and you get somebody on the phone, you tell them what you want, and then you're receiving an SMS telling you where things are. What, what we will have is a feedback loop anyway when, let's say, they send something. Because at this time, actually, this is how they top up their phones. They send SMS. There is a pretty easy menu to request, what's my balance? Mm -hmm. And that's just using that same concept. Right. Um, and so they, it, they don't need any app. They don't need any app. If you're intending to partner with more philanthropist organizations with the sort of end poverty agenda, such as the Gates Foundation, and if you've got any such partnerships in your sites? So one of the challenges sometimes when you, you do go with the donor route is the demands of the donor are very different. Where we look to partner is more partnering with, there needs to be a partnership with government because you are actually changing status quo. You're changing how uh, the distribution, the perceived distribution of wealth is going to happen. So you, and also you're shifting the risk. So in this situation, we're shifting more risk to the farmer. I'm not sure at this time that donor organization are so keen as they should be to do, to, to change the status quo. And I actually believe this is more about bringing trade access to market and access to financial services rather than really looking at creating aid. So answer is no, not really. Specifically, how and how you confirm the info that each QR sticker carries and who does that? How do we so confirm the, the info that each so the QR process throughout the process, the information which is in the QR code is a history of what has happened. And certain information and pieces of data are coming in from different organizations. So when the farmer is handing in his his take there is a confirmation which is done at that point and that is confirmed back to him so he signs at that point when the collector brings it in there's another confirmation the process the different steps there's about let's say in the mango 15 steps and 15 temperatures that have to be done those are evidence mm -hmm. which means all that information is the history of the transaction so when you have that one mango or you have that box or that pallet, mm -hmm. it's, re it's a relating back to that history. Mm -hmm. So that confirmation is really being done via different nodes confirming data or having uh, using the notary to confirm that data. Do you track organic produce also? We can track organic, but that is also then because the way we approach it is really to understand what is the process that is being evidence and not really looking at just creating attaching a document or entering data but throughout the journey being able to evidence so when it comes to my understanding and when it comes to organic it's the chemicals and what's available so fortunately unfortunately for many of the developing countries they are organic. Haiti is organic. It does not have the ability to make self, itself inorganic because mm -hmm. they can't afford the chemicals. But it's not just about the chemicals. At the end of the day, it's also for external market. What are the phytosanitary 
requirements that have to be looked after? Uh, what are the pest control that are going in? So trapping for flies. There's been horror stories, not only Haiti had it happen to it in 1998, I believe, where there was a batch of mango which came in with larvas. And as a result, the whole market was blocked. That has also happened to Kenya uh, a few years back in with uh, Belgium, I believe. So it's very important for the whole of the, the country's market that such things don't happen. As such, this is about being able to evidence and provide that evidence in a very uh, concrete way. And ideally, this way you can start looking at various countries and deciding which, which one is more stringent that you want to go with and therefore meet the requirements for every other country. What you're offering is similar to fair trade, but with blockchain underpinning the process for transparency. I wouldn't say, I say it's more clear trade than fair trade because fair trade does have a need around the quantity mm -hmm. that has to be produced. And the other thing is that underlying me um, with, so, you know, let's say we, we're doing the same thing, which is about, and I do think that fair trade does a lot to better the plight of the farmers, but it does not have, it does not bring to them the access to the market by being able to evidence directly that the farmer has done and also for him to retain greater value. Also, there are base, uh, from what I understand, there are minimum quantity that they have to produce in order to participate. And still, it's based on market, on market price, which are around contract farming. This actually allows for the idea of being able to have open market and using Dutch auction type, you know, reverse Dutch auction, which means the better price gets, gets the goods. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there's some work to be done to change the behavior of the smallholders and what communication challenges do you anticipate in getting full adoption? I, I think that the, the biggest challenge is getting them used to having an advanced payment to be paid ahead of time. So now mm -hmm. we're changing it to say it's an advanced payment. As, and since this happened on a weekly basis, the first couple of times they'll need an advance. But as soon as they have a repeat, it no longer becomes a need because they are getting cash in. So the issue is usually the length of time. Most smallholder farmers globally have a challenge that the person who leaves with their goods may not come back with any money, may not come back with the amount that they expected, or may not tell them the truth about what was uh, the amount received. So with this, there is transparency. And because we are creating that communication loop with them, we are actually creating that knowledge. The other thing is, which is very important, and this is where the government of Haiti has been really, and that group, which is called ICG, has been really tentamed, is creating that um, trust, that network trust with the farmers. So this is what you would have in a co-op. So a co-op could play that same role, but instead of the co-op buying the goods from the farmer, they are helping them get to better markets and also to better products. If you could talk more about what federated learning and distributed algorithms are and why they're important, the technical question for you. <laughs> That's a, it's probably, pretty deep in and I can, uh, I can make sure that we provide the link. So what happens is that in an algorithm, usually when you give the whole data set, so I will get all the information and I have visibility to the whole data, when in reality, I may have five pieces of data that I need for the information that I'm trying to mm -hmm. gather. So what you have in federated learning is instead of sending the data set over, various parties send the pieces that they need. But fundamentally then comes in a problem, somebody still has to be looking at the whole data set to create that uh, algorithm, which is then going to spread that data 
to the various parties that need it. So there's a lot of mostly now when it comes, it's, and it's very much related to health data also. How do you distribute information and maintain privacy? But so this is one of the biggest concerns that's come in around the coronavirus. How do you, so when it comes to contract tracing, how mm -hmm. do you give enough information to those who need to know it without having certain data set which are going to expose who is the individual or the condition of that individual. So there's a lot of work going on now because if you have distributed system, why can you not have distributed data to where basically almost like a zero knowledge, it's not really zero knowledge, but in a short form of zero knowledge that you don't know the information and even the person distributing doesn't know the information, they can then get the data accordingly. So the team at uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology is actually putting a proposal with the National Institute of Technology, the NAIST, to be able to look at that. And there is a lot of work going on. So if you Google federated learning, you'll be able to get some information around that. Another question on the tech and user interface side. Are the smart contracts also created and signed by the smallholder through USSD? No, they're not. The resulting that they have signed the contract will go to them as a text message, but they, there is a tablet which is presented to them. So one of the things that we've been working on is to provide them with a digital, you know, a digital signatory procedure. So some, some people may be uh, familiar. So one of the companies I've been working with is Yoti. We didn't implement this in Haiti. The system is ready, but with all the disruption that have happened, it didn't make sense to try and create more disruption. This is something that we can implement later, but YOT has a solution, which is basically a fob, and it allows, it has enough information such as biometrics, mm -hmm. which can then be offline checked with the, the right system because obviously one of the things that we had to do with uh, our application is to allow it to also be capturing data without being connected to data to, to the network so all the entering can be done at the level of the tablet and as soon as they get into a location where there is connectivity the data will be uploaded but being able to have the farmer sign would be something where they can, right now they're just going to use a signature because they are coming in with an ID and they're coming in with numbered crates and all these things. So you know who they are. But once you start having more people, you want to be able to have them be able to authenticate themselves. And that same authentication can also be used for them to collect their money should they need to. You mentioned value add added products like jam or preservative. How would blockchain be able to track the produce going into each product, like jam, for example? I'm not sure that we, uh, you know, we could. There are people who are asking for that. So they, I've spoken to a couple of projects uh, who are very interested in how to implement circular economy because you, you will know, let's say, this percentage has been rejected. So you think of it as a hopper. You then say where it has, what's the hopper that it goes through? And then in the same way, we are tracing the mango as it goes to the production. There's nothing to say we don't also trace what goes into the bottle. The other thing is what doesn't make it into, let's say, bottling or to jam can also go for animal feed. But it's just being able to not, ha to not have waste. And then you can have also different grades of income. Mm -hmm. And even at this point, what we're concentrating on is the external market. There's no reason not to say, okay, this grade is for external market. This grade is for internal market. And this grade goes for anim for pack, you know, basically transformation. And this goes for animal feed. What are your plans for expansion? What's next for you? And are you hiring? They love what you do. <laughs> <laughs> we are at this time waiting at the end of you know so one of the choices i had to make last year was did i go for investment or did i deliver this beast it's been uh, it's been a lovely beast but it's been at times a journey mm 
Mm -hmm. And what we are doing is we're applying for a smart grant and the next place is actually we're looking to, to do the tracking of silk from silkworm for Thai silk all the way to the clothing going through the whole manufacturing process and the dyeing process. Mm -hmm. And that will be Thai silk and also for wool in Scotland. We're also looking at a project where we would be looking at the wheat and corn and that's again a grant that we're putting through so and just recently i got something from the unicef that unicef is also looking for solution so with the Haley application it's actually an open source we are going to be delivering eventually what is an open source uh, blockchain solution mm -hmm. so hopefully we can see adoption through this way and look at bringing in and the idea is to really look at this as a mechanism where every product is like a commodity so you track that commodity based on how you decide the va what's the valuable things in there so most most things will have which is uh, from a farm will have a harvesting transportation and transformation and a buying process and key to what we're doing also is not we're not only tracing the item, we're also tracing its financial obligation, which then translates back in a form of transparency to then assure a more equitable share for everyone which is participating. How many projects regarding blockchain are there working with the government in Haiti? And if you could, if possible, share the links with us and if you can share anything about who's working and the impact on society especially in rural development of blockchain projects there i do not i do know that there are so we're the only one working with government at this time that i know of there are a couple of projects and also i must say that what we do is we do not have a cryptocurrency we do digitize uh, and tokenize the goods or the transaction because that is part of how the technology works but at the end of the day this is about delivering uh, fiat currency into people's account which has also been some of the challenges in the implementation in terms of projects that are going on in haiti there's the plastic project which was one i love but that you had presented a few weeks back at crypto plastic Club. Bank. yeah plastic yeah. bank Plastic Bank has been working in Haiti and I learned a few things from them in terms of the challenges that they've had in terms of data, but they're reliant on a smartphone aspect. So it's a different, there is a couple of uh, startups which have uh, done work in Haiti around the tokenization of the commercialization of it. And there's actually a great startup um, community in Haiti. There's a company called Bange, Bange, and Bange is led by a very good friend of mine, Marc Alain, and he is working with Facebook, Google, and bringing in a lot of um, youngsters. And what, one of the things that we want to do and we must do is to uh, train people into blockchain technology in Haiti. There's also Startup Boot, I don't, I think it's Startup Bootcamp, Startup Grind is there. And there is, a, and I forget, there's a third group which is doing that. And then finally, one of our key partners in Haiti is actually the ECI. It's called EASY, which is École Supérieure Électronique, which is basically a technology school. So through that, we will also be training the students to how to use the technology. Because I think it's great for us to get an opportunity to work there. But in order to be able to maintain, we also need to make sure that on the ground there's an understanding so that it can grow. Uh, more than just what we have done. Okay, no, thank you very much. And thank you again for sharing everything. Thanks to everyone for joining us and huge thanks again to Tracer, that's T-R-A-C-R, -R, the Diamond Value Connected Platform for the, the diamond industry working on blockchain for sponsoring this series.